So this is our 50th anniversary commemoration of Freedom Summer and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So just like one second of background for our students and then I'll hand it over to the people who can really speak about this. Um, African American leaders have been fighting for years for among many other issues, the right to vote. But they were met by racism from political leaders along with brutality from the Ku Klux Klan and hostility from the white community members around them. In 1964, media attention came to Mississippi, a state where fewer than 7% of black citizens can vote. And the media attention came when a group of students who were mainly white allies, mostly college students, went to Mississippi during what is known as Freedom Summer. The press wasn't all that interested in covering um, the, what was going on in Mississippi when it was solely African Americans there. They were ignored for la in large part. And then a group of white students came and the media came along with them and they were there to help register African American voters and to set up freedom schools. Civil rights battles did not start with or end with Freedom Summer. Today we will hear from two speakers, Mr. Clifton Reed, a Tuskegee Airman, and Dr. David Trimble, a Freedom Summer volunteer. And they will be talking to us about their experiences with civil rights. You will have the opportunity to ask questions or make comments right after each speaker speaks. And then after both men speak, we'll continue a discussion all together that brings the stories of 2014 into, I'm sorry, that brings previous stories into 2014. My students and Professor Kennedy's students, please stay here when the talks end. We'll continue the discussion with our classes and we'll pass around things like attendance sheets. Okay, and also I need to talk to my class because next week um, is Columbus Day and we need to talk about a makeup session. But for right now, let's go to um, our speakers and to the incredible history that they bring to us and the incredible power in the acts that they did. Um, and the future that we have to now take hold of and look at. So I'd like to introduce Professor Esther Pearson, who will introduce Mr. Clifton Reed. Good afternoon. It is certainly my honor and esteemed pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Clifton Reed. Now he's a wonderful man in terms of his experiences and his willingness to share. He is a scholar par excellence, as well as an educator. Uh, Mr. Reed has worked in the Wilmington public school system, as well as uh, did a tenure with the Massachusetts Department of Education. Uh, in his retirement years, he went back to school, went back to college to attend the Harvard Institute for Learning and Retirement Program. Among all of his accolades is certainly the fact that he is a Tuskegee Airman. And that means that he's part of that elite group that made the difference for African Americans in terms of being involved in military service. He's the husband of the late Dolores Reed, and he has one daughter, Rosalind, in which I know and am friends with. And I would say that being a graduate from Lincoln University is also something of Missouri that he could put up front in terms of his accolades. He is a wonderful man, a great friend, and the kind of person he is when he was asked to speak one of his colleagues uh, that he went to school with at the Harvard Institute had put together a book of songs and poems and what could be considered basically short stories on wings of song, a journey into the civil rights era by Molly Lynn Wyatt. And he has signed this and is donating it to the library so that after this day, your continuing will certainly go on through reading this book. If you could give Mr. Clifton Reed a hand of applause as he comes forward. I welcome you to LaSalle. Thank you.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, faculty, administrators, students, and if I haven't covered everyone, saints and sinners. <laughs> Just thinking about being on the campus in years past, history wasn't particular enticing or open to me as a subject to pursue. But now, seven, eighty years, uh, you stand as history, and it gets a little more interesting as you move along. So you want to make more history, but people who are here from the village, I say more power to you, and just keep moving, and make more history. The first thing that I want to do here is to take pleasure in letting LaSalle College know and the instructors for the program that the NAACP Northeast Regional Conference just last month uh, changed the awards for one of the civil rights advocacy uh, programs to name it after the three young men who lost their lives in Mississippi in 1964. And that leads me to talking about some of the history of New England, the Northeast, and your community. But we hope, that is within the NAACP, that there will be a groundswell movement to make this particular incident one of national uh, remembrance. When you think about it, at that time, if you were in the Boston area, you had someone over at Harvard who was saying, turn on, light up, drop out. There were people who were walking the streets saying, hell no, we will not go. There were people were saying that you don't have to be a weatherman to know which way the wind is blowing relative to how the government was involving young people in a war, particularly young people who were less than 21 years of age, were given draft cards. They were burning these draft cards, going to Canada to avoid becoming involved in that war. These two men, or three men, I don't know if they ever voted in an election or not, but there's something immoral about asking an individual to go halfway around the world to become involved in a struggle in which you did not vote for. And because of that, in 1970, there was an amendment to the Constitution authorizing the voting age to be lowered from 21 to 18. And for that, I think it's worth remembering for all times. Benjamin Franklin said something about voting. He says, it's a great idea that everybody should be involved in it. But when you put as a criteria for voting that you must be a property owner, there's something a little odd about that. He says, if I own a mule today, which is property, and I go to the polls and I vote, which is okay, but next year, the mule dies. I go to the poll, I have no property. Which is more important in this process, the mule or myself? So when people put themselves in harm's way to see that other people can have the privilege of voting, something they don't have themselves, there's something morally right about that activity. It's something that we must not forget. I want to sort of talk to you today about this voting 
process. And I want to put it in the terms of reconstructing the Constitution. Reconstructing the Constitution is the same as amending the Constitution. And I want to use reconstruction because what happened during the 60s was an amendment or a reconstruction of the Constitution. There is a doctrine in the legal community called incorporation of certain amendments into the Bill of Rights. None of the activities during the 60s had to do with changing the form of government. These activities were all directed at trying to reconstruct the Constitution to make this government fit the needs of the times and the conditions that exist at that time. This reconstruction or the incorporation doctrine has been around for a very long time and it created problems for legislatures. It created problems for the governors in the South. They wanted to be in the old school, the way it was done in 1789 when the Constitution were first ratified. But if you know from your history, in 1789, when that document came before the people, someone said, time out. We need some amendments. We need to restructure what you have done. And they cried out for the first 10 amendments. And those 10 amendments have been around since 1789. There are some justices on the Supreme Court. Uh, let's see, there's nobody there who made this statement at the present time, but it's good, a good statement to use for looking at the Constitution. This statement comes from Justice O'Connor, Justice Kennedy, and Justice Souter. And they said, I quote, our Constitution is a covenant running from the first generation of Americans to us and future generations. It is a coherent succession. Each generation must learn anew that the Constitution written terms embody ideas aspirations that must survive more ages than just one. It must serve this generation and it must serve every generation to come if you're going to have a democratic government in this country. And for that reason, there have been generations upon generations of African American doing things for the Constitution in the, name, in the name of the Constitution that were sometimes not quite moral, but there was the belief in the continuity of activities to make changes within the government. We need not look any farther than Lincoln's second inaugural address to say whether or not this Constitution as it exists. And when the Civil War amendments were added on, that is the 13th, the 14th, and 15th amendments, Lincoln in his second inaugural address said that he and Jefferson Davis prayed to the same God, but God could only answer the prayer of one of the two. The outcome of that war tells us whether there was morality or any benefit in that struggle. The first group of young people who became involved in trying to restructure the Constitution started 
back in 1861, after the war was over. They saw a need to assist four million and a half black people establish for themselves a place in the Constitution that would be defined by themselves and not by others. These were the New England school marms that Du Bois writes about in his book, Souls of Black Folk. They came to the South for the purposes of giving these newly freed individuals and a half a million other who were freed before the war started, that ability to go out and just establish for themselves a place in the Constitution. The, the need for that was that in 1857, there was a Justice Taney sitting in the Supreme Court, and he was faced with a trial by a, a man, Dred Scott. Tony said that black people have no place in the Constitution that other people who were covered by the Constitution should respect or maintain. He said that black people as slaves were no more than a piece of furniture owned by an individual who could move from one part of the country to the other. And as long as that individual owned the other one, he would have to go. He could not get relief from the Supreme Court to change that particular decision. So, these young people set up schools. They organized churches. They gave black people all of the rudiments that would give them the start on restructuring the Constitution. While there was an occupation army in the South, things worked fine. When the occupation army left, you had violence. Even before the army left, there was the organization of an or the Ku Klux Klan, who would go out and murder people, much the same as what happened in 1964 in Mississippi. And if you recall from the documentary, those individuals felt that there was no court in the state of Mississippi who would bring them to justice for what they had done. After the Army left, there was a Civil Rights Act passed in 1875 saying that, wait a minute, if a man wants to go to a hotel, has the price of a room, wants to go to a restaurant, has the price of a meal, wants to travel on a train with a fare to get from point A to point B, you should let him go. But in 1883, the court says, no. That's not covered in the Constitution. Something has to be done. In 1896, many of you know about a young man from New Orleans took a case to the court, Plessy versus Ferguson. He says, hey, I got the ticket to ride. Why can't I sit any place on this train that I want to? And again, the court said to him, by the way, the, the 
chief justice on this court was named Brown, which is sort of ironic based upon what happened lately. But the court says, hey, separate but equal is okay. Now this upset a lot of people because then the railroads have got to look around and say, do we need separate railroads? Do we need separate cars all together? You know, it's going to cost you a lot of money in rolling stock to, to do this. But then the states begin to figure out, well, we can draw curtains, we can do uh, all sorts of things to accommodate this decision that the court has made about separate but equal. And that, at that point, African Americans sort of felt like Jackie Robinson in the ball game. You know about Jackie Robinson, great baseball player. When he went to the great beyond, the owners up there who own all the universe. Says, Jackie, I know you had a rough time in that life. And say, we want to give you everything that you ever wanted. So he says, I'd like to manage a baseball team. <laughs> so the owner says, we got the people right here for you. We got Wagner, we got Ruth, we got all the, all the big hitters. So they send a message down to hell, you know, talk to the Dallas. We got a baseball team up here. You want to play us? The guy said, oh, yeah. He said, we'll play you. He said, we'll wait, beat you, too. He said, what do you mean you're going to beat us? We got the best players in the world here. He said, nah. He said, you might have the best players, but we got all the umpires. <laughs> so if you don't vote, that means that you're going to have somebody else calling the shots in your game. And depending upon that individual, you may not have a chance to win. So voting is highly important in the democratic process. But at that point, in 1896, when that decision was handed down about separate but equal, there were other things happening in terms of African Americans. That generation of in individuals, like my grandparent, would have born before 1900, had enjoyed some of the prizes under the Constitution. They had seen what could be done if you kept your eyes on the prize. There was a man down in Jacksonville, Florida, who wrote a song in 1900. This, he and his brother collaborated to put this song together called Lift Every Voice. And this song acted as sort of a solidifier between young people who were in the school who were born after 1900, but before the First World War. Also, that group of people, my grandparents, by 1900 had put together some 30,000 teachers in schools colleges and the like to teach others on how to get a hold of this thing called the vote. There at 1900 there were about 2,000 black college graduates. There were four black people with doctorate degrees. But the numbers of schools, I don't have the, the numbers offhand, but the numbers of schools that were built by an individual by the name of Julius Rosenwald, he and his brother put together 
the Rosenwald Foundation. I asked a lot of people, you know, you know who Julian Rosenwald was? No. Well, there used to be a story down in Kenmore Square, Sears and Roebuck. Rosenwald, at an early age, bought stock in that store, took over, and out of his resources, through that business, decided if there are people needing a chance to set their own destiny, I want to do what I possibly can to assist them wherever I can. So there were thousands of teachers and schools put in place in the South through the Rosenwald, and there are many communities in the South today that are putting up memorial plaques of these Rosenwald schools because education is one of the things that you use as your ordinance or your weapon to ensure that you have your voting rights. Political justice or voting rights was something that Frederick Douglass himself recognized before the Civil War. He indicated, or he stated, in 1857 up at New York, where they were celebrating the holiday of independence in Haiti. His statement was that power concedes nothing without a demand. And if you don't have the power and you want to dine at the table of political justice, you're going to get only what you can take. No power, you can't take anything. Now, if you walk to the table and you have something that you can take, you can't keep it unless you have the power to keep it. So no, pow no power, you get nothing. No power, you keep nothing. And I think there are headlines in the paper today about the, Silver, the Voting Rights Act, the 64th, on renewal. And they're always trying to take something away from you. And if you don't keep the power or strengthen yourself, it will be taken away. My parents preached the gospel to me. Land ownership, education. Many African Americans lost land between 1861 and 1900 because the system was working against them, they didn't have the political power to retain that land. It's, my parents said, get an education, put something in your head, because education is the one thing that they can't take away from you. And if you have the education, the ability to build up political strength you can get access to all the opportunities that are available in this country. The, there was a sort of a harbinger, some type of an advent, some signal that we're coming down the line on everything that was going to happen. In the case of the Civil War, the Dred Scott decision was part of that advent. You knew something was going to happen because you couldn't continue in a land where some people were free, some people were enslaved. And you were trying to develop 
an industrial-based country in this country, and you need skilled people in order to do this. You had sort of a harbinger of what was going to happen in 1964 when the decision was handed down by the court in 1954 when Earl Warren said there is no place in this Constitution for separate but equal. There were people who were not satisfied with that because, again, here you have people sitting at the table for political justice who were afraid that somebody was going to take something away from them and they would not be able to get the type of justice that they wanted. So when you start pushing for the vote, this is the outflow of that. What are the harbingers of the next reconstruction of the Constitution that we need? If you're going to have an educational system in this country that is going to produce the type of individuals that we want it to produce, then you're going to have to look at that and see what do we need to change in order to turn that around. It's not only physically unsafe in many instances to travel on college campuses, but it's intellectually unsafe to travel on college campuses in this country. I want to give you one last quote of a man, a prophet, I would say, who grew up in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. This man had the vision to say in 1903, looking at back at what these school marms had done in the South. He says, they made Tuskegee possible. And he's right, because many of the men who went to war, World War II, in the 332nd Fighter Group, were under 18 years of age. But they believed in the Constitution, they believed in the country, and they made a place for themselves and others in the Constitution. And lastly, there's an American poet by the name of Walt Whitman, who in 1867 wrote a group of poems entitled it, I, the Leaves of Grass. And in 18, his 1867 edition, he included in that set of poems one that said, I hear America singing. And if you're familiar with Whitman, he was the American poet laureate of his day. But there was another poet by the name of Langston Hughes who came along in my parents' generation that we got to know through the Harlem Renaissance and other classroom activities when I was in high school. Hughes wrote a poem and said, I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am because I too am American. So with that, I will pause for questions and answers, and then we'll move from there, okay?
have time for a couple of questions now and then have a larger discussion after Dr. Trimble speaks. But I also want to really thank you for putting what we're talking about in a historical context and for bringing us into the importance of the vote and how critical it is. And I really, really appreciate that. So um, any questions for now or thoughts for now? You said at some point uh, in your talk, unless I misunderstood that African Americans at a certain point in history did things that weren't entirely moral. Did you mean that weren't entirely legal? Because they were illegal, but I would consider them moral. Uh, they were legal. For instance, do you consider war to be moral? Personally? No. <laughs> do you consider war to be legal? Sadly, yes. But there is no such thing as a holy war. Mm -hmm. And when we can say that uh, the creator is on our side, but I think if you chase through the origins and the history of war, per se, for the most part, you are annihilating for a, you can find a rationale of, of cause for going to war, but the behavior itself is highly irrational. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have peace on earth, you have to do something about that activity on the part of mankind. Yeah. From a former fighter. Give a lot of credence to what you say. Yes, sir. <coughs> was, America violating moral, was America violating its moral obligation when it entered the Second World War? When we went into the Second World War, was there? Yeah. The question is, was America violating a moral concept when it went into the Second World War? And if you Again, look at the Second World War just alone in its entirety and the causation for that, which was something that happened uh, in Europe that caused us to go there. We say it was, we had an interest, but not necessarily a moral interest in trying to correct something that was immoral going on. And what could we have gone into it? Pardon? What could we have gone into it? Should we have gone, should we have gone into World War II? After the murder of six yeah. million people and many, many, many more. Yeah. I'm not sure. I could give you a I, th I think a lot of what you're bringing up and that David Trimble will continue is just what does it mean? for people in power to deem another group of people as unequal, unworthy, and then how do you deal with that? And I think you try to give us a history of how it has been dealt with and a history that many people are not aware of. Um, and I, I don't know if there's another question about that before we continue with the speakers. So we'll have you both back up here pretty soon, but let's have another round of applause. I just also would like to ask people, I forgot to do this at the beginning, if anybody still has a cell phone off, on rather, this is a good time to give it a nap. And you know, as my classes know, I always say that every good cell phone needs a nap and then we'll wake it up and give it a lot of attention in about another hour and a half or hour. Um, okay. So I, I want to thank you again. And 
It is a pleasure to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Dr. David Trimble. Um, I know, I keep saying Dr. Trimble, can I just say David for now? Um, it, it's just hard because I've known him as David for a while. I've known David for years before I ever found out that he was a Freedom Summer volunteer. Back in 1964, David was a Northern College student who could have stayed here in the North. He could have voted in elections if he was old enough. He could have ignored the news. He could have ignored hearing that African Americans down South could not vote, that they risked their lives to even suggest that they wanted to register, that they could be tortured, castrated, hanged for just trying to get a ballot, that their churches could be firebombed, their houses burned down, their leaders ignored or killed, their bodies thrown into water or buried in graves while they were still alive. David could have avoided that knowledge, but he didn't. He risked his life in 1964 to go down south to be an ally of so many people who did not have the rights that he enjoyed. He will tell you how this experience shaped him. Let me tell you that Dr. Trimble is a licensed psychologist and family therapist, and his work continues to look at that interplay of culture, social class, gender, families, and social justice. He has a private practice in Brookline, and he teaches at the Multicultural Center for Training in Psychology. He's a founding member of BICAP, the Boston Institute for Culturally Accountable Practices. He's also a member of one of my favorite, if not my favorite organization, the American Family Therapy Academy, where for many years he has co-facilitated an accountability group for white allies. David received his doctorate in clinical psychology from Harvard University's Department of Psychology and Social Relations, and he has committed his entire life to acts of social justice. His wife, Dr. Jody Kleiman, is also a dear friend, a psychology professor at the Mass School of Professional Psych, and a social activist, and she is now in our library grading papers because she couldn't get them done, but luckily there's a videotape because she really wanted to hear David speak. So with that, let me introduce Dr. David Trimble. Good afternoon. I'm usually, I'm usually taller than the last speaker, so I have to make that adjustment. So, uh, Thank you very much for providing the historical context, which is very, very important. Um, Mississippi in the, in the Delta of the United States had a very, very large African-American population because Mississippi was at the core of the plantation system in slavery times, and there was a lot of labor from African-Americans. After the, uh, the South lost the Civil War, um, there were challenges for the people who owned the enormous concentration of wealth that came with the slavery economy because the poor white people were organizing with the poor black people in political action that was a threat to the established order. And at the same time, um, through a national deal making at the presidential election level, the uh, occupation army was taken out and reconstruction was undone. And so the, 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 the wealth in the South established a system um, which I'm gonna call apartheid because in fact the system of apartheid in South Africa was designed on the Southern American model. When apartheid was being designed in South Africa, um, they came to the American South to learn how to do it. So I will be using that term for the subjugation of African Americans, so that the establishment of an apartheid system in the South, essentially, uh, it, it mitigated the threat. Now, my wife Jody Klein is holding my glasses, so I'm just gonna take a moment to put on my glasses. Big time. <laughs> Thank you so much, now you can see me too. Um, so, so Mississippi was legendary for being the most oppressive, violent, oppressive place for people of African ancestry. 
mostly because there were so many African Americans and it was really essential for their ruling interest to keep them down. And so they established uh, through the Ku Klux Klan and other kinds of violent terrorist activities an enforcer for an ideology of white supremacy which was critical to maintaining the, the power of the wealthy in the South. And that's the historical context in which Mississippi became what it was. The comedian Dick Gregory um, sort of encapsulated what it was like to be African American in Mississippi by saying that he spent several years in Mississippi one night. Uh, the lynching, the subjugation wa was enormous. And um, in Mississippi in 1964, you could be arrested if you were a young African American man for reckless eyeballs. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to what reckless eyeballs was? Looking at white. Yeah, uh, looking at a white woman, basically. So that there was a whole sexual mythology that had to do with the rape of African American female slaves that then became transformed into a fear of the African American male. It was a scary place and you couldn't vote if you were African American unless you were a little crazy, very brave, and basically owned land, speaking to what you were saying about owning land. The land owners, the few African American land owners in Mississippi, some of whom served in World War I and World War II, were determined to get the vote. But to vote in Mississippi at the time, you had to interpret the Mississippi Constitution to the satisfaction of the registrar of voters in the county, which essentially meant that very, very few, like literally hundreds uh, of African Americans were, uh, were able to vote in Mississippi. So in that context, as the civil rights movement developed with the freedom rides and, and other kinds of, of mass actions, the uh, there was a 1963 March on Washington where uh, Martin Luther King gave his famous speech. There was, an, there was a movement for civil rights, but it pretty much stopped at the Mississippi border because of the tremendous amount of violence and suppression that kept it from going further. Because there were so many African Americans in Mississippi that if they got the vote, there would be substantial changes, and as indeed there have been as a result of the activity of the Mississippi Freedom Summer. There was an indigenous movement of African Americans, mostly landlords, uh, landowners, I beg your pardon, some of them also landlords, to, uh, to fight for the vote, but they were not making any headway. And so they called in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which I will call SNCC. How many people from LaSalle Village recognize the name SNCC? I love it. How many people not from LaSalle Village recognize the name SNCC? I love that too, that's good to see. <laughs> so the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was called in to help the indigenous movement organize people to vote. And um, they were getting nowhere. Um, there were a number of people killed, a number of people killed. Bob Moses was sort of the lead of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. They were not getting anywhere um, despite taking enormous risks. Am I coming across through this? I can't tell, okay. Uh, despite taking enormous risks. And so the idea was floated that if you brought a bunch of college students from the North, particularly explicitly white college students from the North, that this would have the effect of drawing the national gaze on Mississippi. And Mississippi was so extreme that the feeling was that these, the, um, the intensity of the reaction to the effort to get the vote being highlighted by all of these middle-class white college kids coming down would be enough to tip the balance. Bob Moses was reluctant to do this because he knew that he was putting a lot of lives at risk. It was basically when one of the native Mississippians was, um, who was working in the voting rights movement was approached by a white man in public in daylight, walked up to him and shot him and basically got away with it, that Bob Moses realized that it was necessary to do this. So in 1964, um, hundreds and hundreds of, um, of middle-class northern college students, most of them white, not all of them, Bob Fully Love was my companion um, in a small group that organized DeSoto County. He is an African-American man, the son of a surgeon. But for the most part, it was, it was white kids coming down. We got trained in Miami, and it was a very difficult time because 
the SNCC veterans who were very traumatized, and so we're talking about essentially a combat-like situation, so there's a fair amount of traumatic stress associated with being in the civil rights movement in the South. They're dealing with all of these white kids who are basically very, very naive and not knowing what they're getting into. So we were trained pretty rig rigorously. We were trained to understand that we were white, which is one of those things, if you're white, you can avoid learning, is that you're white. But we learned about our whiteness. We learned about the tremendous risk that was involved and that there was no guarantee of safety. But each one of us had a community um, of people who were sort of supporting us and going to the local media in one way or another, directing the national gaze on what happened in Mississippi. Uh, there were two waves of training to go down to Mississippi, both to do voter registration work and also to, to um, work in the freedom schools. At the end of the first wave, I was in the first wave, Bob Moses announced that three civil rights workers had disappeared. Okay. Uh, Michael Schwerner was, an, was a, um, an experienced core uh, civil rights worker. He was going with Andy Goodman, who had just arrived that day, and also with James Cheney, who was an African-American Mississippian. Andy and, and Mickey were uh, Jews, okay, white Jews. And um, they had disappeared, and we were pretty much told that they were probably dead and their bodies were not discovered until about two and a half months into it. So we all went down knowing that this was real, that, that, that we were taking the risks, but that um, but we, for one reason or another, believed in doing what we were doing. And so for a while at the beginning, we set up the Freedom Schools, we began to bring the people to the courthouse to register to vote, but we got actually not that far with getting people to register to vote because the registrar could say, I don't accept your interpretation of the Mississippi Constitution. You're not registered. Now we had another plan and that became the foreground of what the voter registration volunteers did. And that was to organize a shadow party called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And the idea was that we would go to people and say, we understand that you may not feel safe to go to the courthouse to vote, but are you willing to sign a document to say that if you could, you would vote and join the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party? And we registered many, many people in the Freedom Democratic Party who were risking their lives to sign those papers, but they were less publicly exposed. And um, we built that party in the course of just a few months to where the local counties elected delegates to a state convention. At the state convention elected delegates to the national convention, and we sent the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party to the Democratic National Convention to challenge the legitimacy of the Mississippi Democratic Party delegation. This was the, uh, the national convention that nominated Lyndon Johnson. He wanted nothing to do with this. He correctly uh, predicted that he would lose the South, um, and he did everything that he could to prevent the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party from being seated. And, and finally, we were offered what was called a compromise, and this was the compromise, um, that they would not seat the Mississippi Democratic, the regular delegation, who had already committed, by the way, to Barry Goldwater. The Mississippi Democratic Party delegation had already committed to Barry Goldwater, the Republican candidate. Um, and they would select two of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party delegates to be delegates at large. Um, that was not accepted by the Freedom Democratic Party delegation. But the national exposure to what was going on in Mississippi, succeeded by the national exposure that happened with the Selma March the following year, where a march to Selma, Alabama for voting rights was very brutally uh, suppressed, created the conditions for the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And so the consequence of this direction of the national gaze on the extreme reactionary violence of the South was sufficient to create a, a national shift. And um, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 essentially enfranchised African Americans throughout the South. Now, um, I have to say that the Republican Party 
of the United States of America is busily trying to undo the effort to establish the right of African Americans to vote anywhere. And you're seeing this happen everywhere. Uh, and so this struggle for voters' rights is a continuing struggle. But things happened as a result of the civil rights movement that were transforming. So I'll, I'll, I'll describe that in two ways. One is that when African Americans got to vote, they did vote, and Mississippi has more African American elected officials than any other state in the union, which you would expect since it has such a large concentration of African American citizens. When I went back to a 40th reunion in Holly Springs, Mississippi, which was where I was based during the Freedom of Summer, the mayor was African American, the sheriff was African American, the Chamber of Commerce was African American. I went down a street in Mississippi that I would not have dared to go down um, because it would have been my life 40 years before it. And there's a big banner over the street saying, Chamber of Commerce welcomes the civil rights volunteers. So there, there were changes in the political system in the sense of elected officials. However, in Mississippi still, African American students get the worst education in the country. So, you know, not all has been solved, but a lot has changed in terms of the politics, and there's a lot more work to do in terms of the politics. What I found particularly interesting, I went down to the 50th reunion of the Mississippi <laughs> Freedom Summer this summer, in Jackson, Mississippi, at Tougaloo College. And it's impossible to overstate how pervasive the authoritarian suppression of people of African ancestry was in Mississippi 50 years ago. Basically, you were not allowed to look at a white person. You had to sort of shuffle your feet and look down. You had to get off the sidewalk if a white person was coming along. You can get arrested for reckless eyeballs. Emmett Till, uh, who, who stuttered, and his mother told him to whistle when he was trying to find words, whistled in a store and wound up lynched because there was a white woman in the store. So, um, so the culture of subjugation and the rituals of subordination were very, very powerful. Um, so I had a moment uh, at the reunion. I'm in a uh, Starbucks in, um, inside of a Target store in Jackson, Mississippi, on my way to Tougaloo for a meeting of the reunion. And there's a 300-pound African-American, very dark African-American young man who's the barista. And uh, there's a diminutive white woman with a ponytail, also in her 30s, ordering her coffee. And they're joking with each other. And not only were they joking with each other, but he said, do you want steamed milk with that? And she said, yes, sir. Now, 50 years before that scene had happened in Mississippi, um, he could well have been killed. Her family would have been driven out of town. There, there are ways in which the, the public space in Mississippi has changed because of the fact that, as Mr. Reed said, you know, African Americans voted, they exercised the vote, they had power, and I've got five minutes, okay? Five or six minutes, okay. So let me just say briefly what's involved in why I did this, because I'm looking around at the young people here. You know, you can actually change the world, and you're in a position to change the world if you don't have a family, a job, and other things. You can take risks and make a difference in the world. Um, and so I went, to, I went to the, I come from a progressive family, I went to the March on Washington. Um, I put on a big March on Washington button, I hate to wear political buttons, but I put the button on and I said, I'm gonna wear this button until I join the Civil Rights Organization. I went to Clark University in Worcester, joined the Worcester Student Movement, and the leader of the Worcester Student Movement basically uh, recruited me to, to do the Mississippi Freedom Summer. And I knew at the time that I was risking my life. Now, I was 19. And a lot of people enlist in the armed services when they're 19. They also know they're risking their lives. It has a somewhat different meaning to you when you're 19. But it, you know, it's obviously a serious commitment. Um, 
But you can make commitments now to social change that you're in a position to do because of where you are in the life cycle. And it's worth doing that because you can make a difference and there's plenty to work on. So, ready for questions. Thank you so much, and thank you again, Mr. Reed. This is just an amazing afternoon, and I'd like to open it up to any sorts of questions, whether it's about their own experiences or just something you want to know about the talk that isn't their own experience. But please, this is um, a once-in-a-lifetime, perhaps, opportunity to have these two men in the same room with this life experience. Question for David. What did your parents think of you as a 19-year-old going to Freedom Summer? Did they support you or were they like, we don't want you to do this? I think that they were afraid for me. They did support me. I had, when I was 17 years old, um, stood out in a public park during one of John F. Kennedy's air raid drills as an act of civil resistance. And, and they came from a progressive background. So it was certainly part of the family tradition. They were afraid, certainly. They organized in the sense of making sure that they were in touch with um, our elected representatives and with the media and that sort of thing. I, I have to confess, I did something really rotten to them. Like, like a lot of the white students, I wanted to stay past the summer, which was actually not a good idea and created some problems. Um, and Diarmi Bailey, who recruited me, basically told me I had to come back, so I didn't. But I wrote my parents a letter in which I said, you had to come to terms with the fact that, um, that I might lose my life. You're gonna have to deal with the fact that I'm not coming back to college. Um, I was 19, I was a jerk. But, uh, <laughs> but we survived all that. But I did get a lot of support from them and they were scared. Could you just do a follow-up on that, on the reasons why a lot of the white students were asked to go back after a certain period of time? Well, that's a complicated story. Um, basically, although we got a lot of training about whiteness, not all of us took the training in. And what you had was an indigenous movement of African Americans in Mississippi, a wave of white middle class kids coming down and not getting that they were being called on for a few months in order to sort of carry through something. Basically, a lot of people wanted to take over. Now, I understand that it's really hard to ask people to risk their lives and their churches and their families and their livelihoods to engage in this struggle, but we really needed to leave. And a lot of us didn't, and that led to, ultimately, to a split in the movement that, from which we still suffer. From the other side of the coin, and we're talking about the same thing, there was a song uh, that perhaps some of my friends from the village know, that, Mom, I'd rather do it myself. Okay, you ever hear that song before? In the history of the civil rights movement all over the country, there was this notion that what I thought had to be the mirror image of what he thought. But in the 60s, you had this new generation of people coming along saying that they want to do it themselves if you show me how. In the beginning, in the 1860s, that the people from New England came with the notion of, we will show you how. There's four million people trying to find their place in the Constitution. There's too many of them for just a few white people from the North to do that. The South, Southern people were not going to do it. They didn't have the, the political thinking. If you look at Southern politicians, you look at the Southern educational system. Mississippi had a poor educational system 
before 1960, before 1900, and before 1789. The population of the country when it moved about these United States in coming together had varying degrees of education. Education for this country, the common school curriculum, the high school, the notion of a high school did not come into fruition until around 1861. And that was through a lot of hard work on part of the people trying to get this country educated. So in a state where the prime industry is hard labor, you don't have technical people. Eli Whitney came from where? Massachusetts. Whitney invented the cotton gin for an industry that was not big in Massachusetts. I, I, I don't know if anybody ever grew any cotton in Massachusetts. They, they grew tobacco down in Connecticut. But Mississippi, in its development, had a different level of requirement for intellect. Think about, you're, you're a college student. You're from New England. You got all that rich background about thinking how to solve problems. So the next reconstruction of the Constitution, I would say it's gonna to have to come from people like you. And the problem is not going to go away. So again, this back and forth, now maybe we can. Um, just on that point, in, in Mississippi in 64, the school year was organized according to the cotton agricultural season. So there was like a two week vacation to chop the cotton, to weed the cotton, and another time to harvest the cotton. So the school system was secondary to the cotton industry. I, I have been down in Jackson, Mississippi on like a civil rights movement like in the past three years. And like I see firsthand experiences like how like even today there's still separation between every, like the whites and the African Americans and the culture. And I was wondering what we can do up here to help with that still today. Like what organizations we can do, what money we can donate, and questions and stuff like that. Do you know any? I think actually there's a lot to do up here. Okay, I think that sending people down to Mississippi at that time was, was a smart political move in the context. But uh, one of the first things that we, that we studied in our training at the University of Miami was that racism was not unique to the South. So, so I would say um, there's plenty to deal with about race. You can join an anti-racism group on the campus and start to open your mind to what can be done here. This might be my answer. Well, I think that Let me uh, leave with you a definition I think that we need to uh, think about. You cannot have slavery without a law. The war was about changing that law. You cannot have any type of segregation without a law. Martin Luther King says, I want to use the law, the Constitution, to change things. I, that is, I want to desegregate this country. Integration is something that has to come from within the individual. And you can't do that with the law. There is no law on this earth that you can write and say, you must love that person. You're not going to get any place. But I can use the law to keep that person from killing me. And that's the whole thing about the Constitution. The Constitution says everybody must have an equal opportunity under the Constitution. Now, what you do with that, that's something else. So you put the law there saying that you cannot kill a person, you cannot lynch a person, because that's 
there's no place in the Constitution for that. Desegregation is what the Constitution calls for. I'm just wondering, related to your question, whether either of you can speak about the upcoming elections and whether there are any major issues that have to do with this topic and how students can learn more about that to make up their minds. We're both lunging for the microphone. Go ahead. <laughs> Upcoming election. One of the major problems facing this country is education. We have people coming out of school with student loans up to Gazoo. That's a form of slavery. You'll be paying off that loan for the next 20, 30, 40 years. But if you're going to have a democracy and you want educated people, you don't want to put education outside of the price of the people that you want to educate. So we need to talk to the candidates and say, hey, uh, no, I won't call any uh, candidate's name, but the person who is going for the office say, what are you going to do for public education in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? We have a state university system that is somewhat questionable. In the city of Boston, you have people saying that, hey, you don't need vocational education. We're going to close uh, Madison Park down. Well, wait a minute. Booker T. Washington was saying 100 years ago that we need trained technicians. So, Let's do something about public education, secondary, post-secondary. So that's one of the things that I would look at in the upcoming election. Okay, I think a, a, a Google search, which you guys can do much faster than I can, <laughs> um, will get you to the current Freedom Summer program that's going on into the fall of <laughs> students of your age across the country working to, to, uh, to uh, help people to register and get them out to vote. If we look at the amount of power that marginalized people have in this country and we look at the proportion of them who actually vote, that's something that can, we can address now. And, and it involves the same sort of stuff that Bob Fully Love and Bob Feinglass and I were doing. You go door after door after door and most people don't want any parts of what it is, but gradually over time, you get more and more people who you can move and inspire to, to register if they're not registered and vote if they're not voting. If we could, I mean, the people who are this country are not running this country. And if the people who are this country were more engaged in, in, in electoral politics, we would see a very different system than we have now. And as you're doing that, I hope people will learn about what the stands are that the candidates are taking, because with a bunch of new laws that came out, you can have advertisements that just aren't true. So um, it's worth having a discussion of what do the um, candidates believe and what does their party believe and how does that affect you and how does that affect people that you're supporting. If you're having any trouble thinking of a question, all I want you to do is stay for the people who are at the college. Um, stay the age you are, move yourself back 50 years, and imagine yourself being this guy. Imagine yourself being this guy. What would you want to know from them? They're here. Just, you know, peel, I, I'm gonna peel even more than 50 off, because you were a Tuskegee Airman, um, what years? I was the Tuskegee. You want to know when I was going to know? Yeah, when were you? 30 years old? You were, oh, okay. My okay. thoughts are, when, when I was 30, I was thinking about staying alive, number one. But I, I was married, I had a family, and I was thinking about the future. And 
we were move, moving about different places, and I wanted a future for my daughter uh, that was different from my future. Coming from Tennessee, Tennessee was the last place I was thinking about retiring in. And fortunately, in 1964, I got transferred to Massachusetts, out to, up to Hanscom, and I said, voila. One of the best educational systems in the country, MIT, everybody wanted to go to MIT, wanted to go to Radcliffe, uh, whatever. I said, here is where my daughter can perhaps get some of the best exposure to this type of society that I can see in the future for her. And I can tell her about all of these past experiences, but I didn't want her to uh, experience the past experiences that I had. So I have to say that I was transformed by my experience in Mississippi. Uh, some of it had to do with traumatic stress, but a lot of it had to do with a different lens on the country that I live in and a different sense of what my responsibilities are in that country. I would say that uh, there are enormous tools of communication and activism that are available to you now that were not available to us. But I think certain fundamentals remain. You have to be able to contemplate what is wrong, contemplate evil, and be able to stand it enough to gaze at it and to make a commitment to do something about it. And as you do so, you will, on the one hand, not have such strong connections with people who aren't willing to walk the road that you are walking, and you will find yourselves walking arm in arms with others who are walking the road that you're walking. And in this country, you have a lot more opportunity to make a change than in a lot of other societies where there's been an enormous amount of social activism over the past five or six years, and far less opportunity to actually improve and change the society that you're in. So it takes, it takes a stomach as well as heart. I'm wondering whether any of our LaSalle Village residents have any thoughts or memories about what it was like for you during those years and that you want to share with our students. Okay. I may be the oldest person in this room, but I remember 1960 very, very well. And my own son was involved in the student activities registration. And we were also very close friends of the Goodman family and the Schwerner family. So I have a lot of personal recollections that are very deep and painful, as well as appreciating the work that they did. What troubles me so much now is to see and hear the kind of racism directed at the president and others in our society. I can't believe that it's 50 years <coughs> since then and the same kind of anger and uh, scathing remarks are made by uh, some about Obama, about policies related to equality. So there's a lot of work left to be done. It didn't start in 64 and it didn't end then. It seems to me 50 years later that you can just choose almost any issue and try to make a change. I got a, I got a, a response to that. This is, this is more of a reflection. Um, uh, last week I was at University of Rhode Island where they had 
another commemoration. I've sort of been going around to all these commemorations. It's really important to understand history not just as major world events, but understand history of things like racism. Like racism. Now, a lot of the legal structure of segregation and apartheid has been disassembled. Racism is alive and well. It is a little bit like a virus in that it hides and conceals itself so well. And a lot of my work, as I've carried on the struggle, has been to bring racism to the foreground. And, and as I've done that, I've been very sad about how people don't know history. I had a wonderful conversation with an African-American teenager um, who clearly was committed to, to the social justice struggle. And there were things that he didn't know that it, where, where certain cultural forms were decontextualized for him. Uh, I, now, I imagine you know about the image of Staggerly. How many people here know the image of Staggerly? Staggerly. All right, so there's two of us in the room. Okay, so Staggerly was sort of an image of the African American who refused to be subordinated. He was really bad in the sense of being an upstart and a rebel and not willing to be subdued. I had a patient who I thought was getting to some difficulty because he was sort of falling into the sort of trap of getting stuck in the Staggerly role, and he had no idea who Staggerly was. And I told him 50 cent, and he immediately got it. <laughs> so 50 cent is the Staggerly of now. But that sort of history, that history of you know, racism up close and personal and how it affects the way people shape themselves is really important history to know. Because this young man, until we had the conversation, and he got it right away, is very bright and very eager to learn. What he understands is that the sort of 50 cent bravado was an answer to the humiliation rituals in the American South to maintain uh, apartheid. So I, had, I gave a very quick history lesson, which he got. But that kind of history is really important to know. I, some of what I, want, what I wanted to say, I think, is related at a different level to what you just talked about. Um, I've been giving a lot of thought to all of this, I think, since last week's movie, but I've thought about it before. And I believe that many of us, and I think that goes for people my age and young people as well, uh, could do well to think about and examine and talk with one another about their own attitudes. Um, I talked, I was talking to some friends, uh, you know, some people I know um, the other day about my belief that many of us, people my age, although we think of ourselves as non-racist, and if we were writing, uh, responding to a questionnaire, would have all the right answers to the questions, and I think would vote the right way most of the time on issues. Many of us, because of our upbringing, because of the years we lived through, um, have unconscious attitudes that influence our be behavior that we're not even aware of or don't even think about. And that refers, I think, to people at all levels of activism, people who are more active and people who are less active, but people who go to the voting booths. I think a lot of the criticism of Obama, and I'm not suggesting he doesn't deserve some of it at least, <laughs> but a lot of the criticism of Obama comes from people who would deny that there's any racial basis to their criticism or their decision not to vote for him, but who unconsciously are very much pushed by their at unconscious attitudes. So I, I believe that for people of all ages, there's reason to think about this, reason to talk with one another, and reason to consider what's pushing us. And um, I think we can be helped to do that by people like you who talk to us and by one another. My, my concluding uh, idea on that is, you think back about Woodrow Wilson. When he was in office, there was a book written called The Birth of a Nation. 
And it, in that book, it talked about the Ku Klux Klan and its role in the South. And Wilson, after reading the book, says, that's the way it happened. So movies were made about it and everything else. It doesn't matter who is in the White House or any place. You can think whatever you like about that person as long as it doesn't interfere with your objectives that are in the Constitution. And if Obama has not made opportunities available for individuals, then he should be voted out. And the, the Democratic uh, administration should be voted out. For a number of years, blacks voted Republican. Franklin D. Roosevelt came along, and Sam says, hey, he's putting money in my pocket. He came up with this alphabet reform for the government, PWA, WPA, CCC, NRA, and he changed a number of things. He made education available for more people. He had his kitchen cabinet, the black cabinet. He had people there advising him. Mr. Roosevelt, the March on Washington was really rehearsed back in 1939. A. Philip Randolph was one of the individuals who was saying to Mr. President, if you don't put us in this armament thing where people are making money, he says, we're gonna march on Washington. So Roosevelt listened to his cabinet, and he says, hey, start civil rights legislation right away so people can become employed and take care of their families. And there was a movement during the Second World War that changed a whole bunch of things. The country had two air forces, one black and one white. But the president changed that. Harry Truman changed that. You cannot legislate what an individual thinks. You can make it so that if the thinking is against the government, it can't be against other people. You have to be understanding of that, that integration is something that is not going to happen by legislation, but desegregation is something that you can do with the law. David? There's two fronts. Uh, there is the front of dealing with the actual social arrangements, as Mr. Reed just said, and there's plenty to do with that. Voter photo ID, there are all of these phenomena that require a direct challenge in political activism. I actually think that that your generation, speaking to the younger people here, are in a better position to take on the racism of the heart. Uh, and that's partly because we have more tools now. How many people are familiar with the construct of microaggression? Not enough. Okay, well all of you can use Google, okay? So before you go to bed tonight, find out about microaggression because that's a critical construct that unpacks how it is that um, that not just racism, but sexism and homophobia are performed in relationships. It's really important to be knowledgeable and literate about that. There, you can also go online and take a test about your implicit racial bias. And it's a very important thing to do. I took it, I have an implicit bias in favor of whites. I'm not surprised by that <laughs> anymore. You know, I've been 50 years in this struggle and I understand that we are all corrupted by a system of white supremacy in which what is true and normal and good is white and everything else is other. And that in one way or another infects and infests all of us and the only way that we overcome it is in solidarity with each other and that requires that we do very difficult work at the same time that we continue to operate politically because that's critical. But we're less likely to get the kind of split that happened in the Civil Rights Movement after the Freedom Summer if people do that kind of work. 
So I'm going to thank both of you. And I just truly appreciate that we had this opportunity and we couldn't have had this opportunity if we didn't have so much support at the school. So we had, and help me if I'm forgetting anything, we had Joanne Montepar working on this and Tessa LaRue, Becky Kennedy, Stephanie Athey, Lori Rosenthal, did I get everyone? Uh, with the support, uh, we, we just had a lot of support to make this, pro oh, Esther, we would not have had Mr. Reed without you, so Dr. Pearson, so for sure. So, and I just wanna really thank our speakers. There's a lot for us to think about and talk about and our, the classes who are here, uh, Professor Kennedy and I will certainly have some opportunity to do that. So my thought is that for our classes, please take a break and get something to eat. And for everyone else, let's just do a last round of applause and a very big thank you.